morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you all. Just a quick bit of housekeeping before we get started this morning. Um, unfortunately, our chair, Brian Boyle, can't join us this morning, but we are joined by Margaret O'Connor, who works in the service policy and evaluation branch at Revenue. So Margaret is going to moderate the session for us this morning, and I just want to say a big thank you to Margaret and a very warm welcome to her and over to you Margaret. Thank you very much Nora and good morning everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today to represent Breen. I'm sure you all agree it's always great when your boss asks you to step in and take on something new. Um, my day-to-day -day role in revenue is centred on developing and delivering quality customer service. And so I and my team have been fortunate to gain lots of practical knowledge and connections through QCSN. I've been a member of the network for some time and I've watched the different topics the network has covered with huge interest. This year we've covered topics like accessibility, feedback from our customers and critically how we can demonstrate responsiveness to that feedback. Accessibility and responsiveness are central to the guiding principles of quality customer service. Of course, these QCS principles are the bedrock for everything we do here at the network as we try to design and deliver effective services for the wide variety of people that we serve. Trust is central to any healthy relationship, whether it's personal, professional, commercial, or for us in the public sector in serving the public. The theme for today's event is building trust with our customers. And as we'll hear, some of those QCS principles are very important drivers of trust in government and public institutions. We have a very exciting lineup this morning, but before we hear from our speakers, I want to extend a very warm welcome to all our QCSN members here today. At last count, I was advised that there are almost 300 of you registered to attend from over 70 public service organisations. That is the value of the QCSN network. It's being able to reach out to colleagues across multiple departments and really benefit from each other's knowledge. So we're very grateful for your continued support and engagement. And we encourage you to share our details with your colleagues and public service organisations who might benefit from being members of the network. In particular, I'd like to welcome new members from a number of organisations. We're joined this morning by new members from the Department of Social Protection, the Property Registration Authority, the HSE and the Department of Health and Donegal County Council. So you're all very welcome as are our regular attendees. Before I introduce the speakers, I just need to do some housekeeping. So a few practical details before we get to the presentations. As usual, we're using WebEx events for our meeting today. While most of you will be familiar with the platform, I just want to remind you, your microphone will be muted by default and only the presenter's cameras will be enabled. The session will be recorded and will be available afterwards. As always, we really want this to be an interactive session. We will have a Q&A session at the end, so please use the Q&A function to send us any questions as we move through the presentations. And we will then bring those questions to our panelists. As a reminder, or for those of you who are new to WebEx, if you look at the bottom right hand side of your screen, you'll see three dots. If you click on that, you'll see the Q&A option. You can go in there and add your questions and you can do that at any point through the session. You don't need to wait until the end because Nora will collate those questions. So we have a really great lineup on our panel today. We have two speakers who will reflect both international and national perspectives on trust and what our organizations need to know to ensure that we build and maintain trust with our customers and that we build those healthy relationships with the public. Before we get to our speakers on trust, I want to tell you about an addition to our lineup. We are delighted to have Maria Owens from One Learning with us this morning. Maria is going to tell us about some of the new customer service courses One Learning have available and the supports they can offer. They really have some exciting courses in the pipeline and that have gone live. Now, given our full schedule for this morning, we will have to be very strict on time with our speakers. And I believe Nora is in the background with a signal should anybody run over time. And that includes me. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce Maria Owens from One Learning, who is going to speak to us about the customer service course offering. One Learning is the Irish Civil Service Learning and Development Centre based in the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. 
It is responsible for the provision of learning and development, which supports the development and, of skills and competencies across the civil service. And this morning, Maria is going to provide the QCSN with an overview of some courses and supports available. You're very welcome, Maria. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear me? Okay. That's fine, Maria. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. So, um, I am going to fly through this. Okay. And, um, as discussed, um, I have only a short period of time, so I'll go through this as quickly as I can. And um, uh, the the lads will share these slides afterwards. So if you have any questions afterwards, what I'll do is I'll give my contact details at the end and feel free to contact me at any stage to discuss. So for anybody who doesn't know um, who are One Learning, we are the Civil Service Centre for, for Learning and Development. So we provide training for all servants, all civil servants, um, regardless of their grade, their organisation or their location. And we provide all training that's common across the civil service. And as it seems as Margaret's sitting there, I'll use the example that we will never do taxation training for revenue. So what we do is what's common across the civil service. And we are based in the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. So a little bit of background context. So we did a, a really um, in-depth civil service learning needs analysis at the end of 2020, start of 2021, to find out what courses and what learning and development interventions were required for the civil service, not only for now, but into the future, because our contracts are for four to five years. Um, as part of that, um, we engaged with, you know, um, the CSMB and our civil service senior management. We had um, almost 2,000 uh, survey responses from learners directly. We dealt with the HR units, L&D units, our subject matter experts, and our external stakeholders, such as the IITD and the OECD, et cetera. Um, and that was really to determine what courses we were going to need. At the end, we ended up with 52 courses in addition to what we already provided and we went out to tender and we have five contracts in place to deliver those contracts. Um, just to say, our, the, 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 the course is very much the principles around kind of the course development was that we wanted to be progressive. So we expect our courses to challenge and push the civil service. We didn't want what was there previously. They need to be relevant, so we expect all our courses to resonate with and be applicable to the civil service. They are all designed specifically for the civil service context. The learning experience, we want them to be highly interactive, innovative, with a good balance of theory and practice. We want everybody who attends one of our courses to go away with something to put into practice straight away. Equality, diversity and inclusion, so we expect all our courses to incorporate EDI principles and blended working, obviously, to reflect the way that we are working today as well. So they all need to reflect the new blended working environment. In regards to, as I said, we we um, only provide training to civil service, but there's ample scope there for replication of our project across the civil and or public service. And um, obviously the challenges faced by the civil service in effectively serving the people of Ireland are the same for the public service. We already engage a lot with the wider public service in an advisory capacity where we share our, our learnings and um, our expertise where we have it. And we also share content as well where we can in regards to e-learning, et cetera, that we've developed in-house. For example, the home workstation ergonomics, which we have um, put live in the last month, we've shared with a number of public bodies as well. Okay. So, Really, what we're here today to talk about is the one learning customer service courses and our learning pathways. So this is the customer service learning pathway, and we have very much designed these courses around those guiding principles of quality customer service. Um, and all of these courses are now available on the learning management system for enrollment, with the exception of the second customer centric design course, the level two, which is already in design and will be available before Christmas. So I might just fly on from this and just to talk about the, cu the courses that we do have now. So the one that we have, the newest one, 
to add to our catalogue is the introduction to customer centric design. And it's very much to give the participants an introduction to customer centric design thinking tools and applications and guidance on how to identify customers and embed an appreciation of the value of customer understanding when designing those either, you know, absolutely those services, but also in regards to our policies and processes as well. And it's a one day course, so it's really aimed at anybody who's involved with that kind of development piece. We have speaking with clarity and confidence, which is one of my favorite courses um, and it is around kind of equipping the participants with the practical skills and preparation techniques to allow them to kind of unlock their own communication style and and um, to give them the, the confidence to speak with clarity. This course is up to HEO level. We have a second course, which is um, storytelling, which goes from AP to secretary general level, which is also an excellent course as well around the same theme. Uh, communication techniques for challenging customer situations. We worked very, very closely with um, a number of our staff on the front lines in regards to developing this course, both in DSP, revenue and DFA, etc. And it's around equipping the participants with the frameworks theory and the skills that they need to deal with those aggressive behaviours in the frontline um, work. And kind of let them plan in a strategic manner in regards to the techniques that they would use for a particular challenging situation. And it's a two half day course and it's for all grades who are dealing with those difficult situations. Professional writing skills. The goal, the goal of this course is to give the participant a clear understanding of what excellent professional writing looks like. So it's about improving the ability of the learner to write in a way that's focused and concise and using plain language with a clear message and intent for the reader. Um, again, it's a two half day course, but it is really good, particularly for new people who are coming into the civil service. I would highly recommend it. We have two telephone techniques courses. Level one is around, um, you know, giving an introduction and uh, helping the learner to prepare for calls and show them how to handle calls under pressure, etc. And that's kind of for service officer to HEO. We have a second level course. And it's about improving the ability to prepare for calls and how to handle those really difficult calls as well. What kind of maintaining, which is really important, maintaining their own resilience levels as well. Um, and so that's for people who already have um, experience in telephone handling. This is our basic course, and I would suggest that every new civil servant should be doing this course. And it's very much centered around the guiding principles of quality customer service. And it's to equip the participant with the foundation knowledge, the structures and the skills to excel at customer service. Um, and it'll kind of give them an introduction to everything they need to do to better serve our customers. Um, so that is very much one that I would um, be pushing for the majority of new civil servants. I also just wanted to mention um, kind of health and well-being supports that we're doing at the moment, particularly, um, you know, as a result of the pandemic, we've had people who are very much in the front line, um, you know, who need to rebuild their resilience le um, levels and to look after themselves as well. So we've created a suite of um, health and well-being courses and webinars that focus on supporting civil servants in areas such as career development, managing stress and mental well-being. And these courses are available to all and they do address issues, issues such as managing conflict and building resilience for our front facing customer colleagues. So I just wanted to mention that. And the webinar series, these are just a, a kind of an idea of some of our speakers um, that we have had and we will be having. So this month we have um, Rob Heffernan, who's amazing and um, a really lovely man from Cork. And then next month we have the tip star Man Minding Your Money in 2022 with Connor Pope. And it's it's going to be a, a, an excellent um an excellent webinar. Just to show you, I've also included the other learning paths from our for our other courses as well, just for your information, but they will go out as part of the the, the, the pack afterwards and I've probably flown through that absolutely and I hope that was okay Nora that I didn't go over time um okay. but any questions at all what I do is I'm going to put into the chat function um my contact email address and absolutely feel free to contact me at any stage with any questions okay thank you very much everybody
Thanks, Maria. That was a really interesting presentation, and I'm sure that your email is going to be inundated. I personally have a few questions I want to ask you already. Um, it's great to hear about all the developments and the new courses available, but it's also really positive to hear about the supports that are available to our members who work in organisations outside the civil service. It is a fantastic development of the pandemic that we have such a focus on well-being, and I think it's really important that you mention those well-being supports as well this morning. It's also really reassuring to hear that One Learning incorporate EDI principles to all their training. That is absolutely critical in creating trust and understanding for all our people and the customers that we serve from all different backgrounds. The type of courses that Maria spoke about can really help us develop our people and our organisations to ensure that we deliver the service our customers expect. Those services and how we deliver them are critical to the day-to-day -day running of the state. And we've seen this, especially during the pandemic. But customer service is also important because every time we interact with our customers, we are influencing wider perceptions about our organisations and public institutions. For the rest of this morning, we want to discuss those perceptions. And in particular, we want to focus on trust and how we can build trust with our customers. So that brings me to our next speaker, who is Santiago Gonzalez, policy analyst from the OECD Public Governance Directorate. Santiago has been involved in a really, really important piece of research at the OECD, which is a survey on the drivers of trust in public institutions. You may have come across this work and like me, you may be very excited to hear more about it this morning. The survey took place in 2021 and was published just a few months ago. Ireland was among 22 OECD countries which took part and Santiago is going to take us through some of the survey findings and some of the ways other OECD countries have used the survey data to build trust. As we've spoken about at previous events, the important thing with data is how we use it and how we build it into our feedback loops. We're really looking forward to hearing from Santiago this morning, and I know that this topic will be of great interest. So if you do have questions, please add them to the Q&A. I remind you again, down the bottom right of the screen, those three dots, and we'll address them in the Q&A later. You're very welcome, Santiago. Thanks a lot for, for having me this morning. I am delighted to be here with you to share the results of the inaugural wave of the survey on the drivers of public trust. Could you see my screen now or no? Um, no presentation. Yeah. If you just want to try again there, Santiago. Okay. No problem. Let me... Yes, that's yeah. fine. Perfect. If you want to just go into slideshow mode. Okay, I cannot let me um yeah or down the very bottom of the screen either this button because it's covered in your... yeah down the very very bottom I, if oh, I, good yeah good. i think i got it perfect okay so so thanks for having me this morning i am delighted to be here this was a survey as as margaret said and, and thanks for the introduction this survey was implemented in late 2021 in 22 oecd countries in the case of uh, Ireland, it was implemented by the National Statistical Office and it was linked to the labor force survey. So basically some people were asked if they could be contacted for a, uh, for their sur a survey that was our survey on the drivers uh, of trust. The objective of this survey is to understand what drive trust in public institutions. So what is behind the, the perception of public trust in different uh, public uh, players. And all of this is built around the framework on the drivers of public trust, the OECD framework on the driver of public trust that basically recognizes two broad categories, competences, the responsiveness of services, reliability of policies and services and values, openness, integrity and fairness. And many of these talk very closely or are very similar to the guiding principles of the quality customer service that I know are very dear to this network. So I, I hope this will resonate a lot with the work you do and with contribute to, to the discussion. I will focus in Ireland, but we have out of these surveys some results that are common to many OECD countries and that although difference in culture uh, in uh, context, we, there is a narrative emerging that provides some powerful uh, messages. 
I cannot. Uh, okay. So here we go. So I start with the kind of baseline levels of trust. And what we have is that Ireland is a comparatively high trusting country. If you look, trust in the national government is 51% compared to an average of four, about 40 in OECD countries. In uh, terms of trust in the civil uh, service, Ireland is a top performer. So I think this is the highest rank at the OECD with 68% uh, uh, and also very high interpersonal trust in Ireland where you are also a kind of a top uh, performer. Trust is also high for other institutions, for instance, the, the National uh, Guard I, and I hope my Irish is okay, so the police, which is 75%. Uh, uh, the only institution where Ireland fares not so well is the local, local government where it is slightly below the OECD average. So there is variation across institutions, but on average, uh, Ireland is a high trusting country according to the survey results. We also see in our survey that uh, satisfaction with services is an important uh, level of trust in the civil uh, service. And on this, Ireland also scores comparatively well. On average, 63% of the population report trusting administrative uh, services. We also cover and we also ask about other services. Ireland fares comparatively well when it comes to education services, but not so great when we ask or when the survey asks about the health service, health services when only about a third of the population reported uh, trusting them. In, time, in terms of uh, services, there are uh, two other things that I would like to highlight. One is that in general in Ireland, there is a, a very positive percep perception about accessing information. So how the ease of accessing information where uh, over three, uh, give me exactly the, the exact figure, but it's 83% uh, of the population in Ireland think that information is easy to find, which again is a very high figure in the OECD uh, context. And also there is a, a fairly high perception of fairness in the treatment of people own application when they address public institutions and when they come uh, to apply for benefits or uh, services. So on this, uh, this also uh, contribute to explain, of course, these uh, relatively high levels of, uh, of satisfaction. However, there are also some uh, areas of improvement for Ireland and uh, particularly on what relate to the responsiveness uh, of services. And here we see if people expect that uh, services will be improved following their complaints, and this is only about a third of respondents of the population in Ireland who think this will be the case, and also a fairly low percentage of the population that think that uh, there is room and there is potential to innovate within the uh, public sector. This is just about a quarter of the population in Ireland to expect this to be the case. These votes are below the OECD uh, average. This is what I just uh, show is basically the percentage of people that think that uh, innovation or that there is potential to innovate, uh, there is, uh, the, let's say, the space to innovate in the public uh, sector. Our survey, of course, also allows to uh, look at trust level by socioeconomic characteristics. And in general, we find that uh, as expected people with lower education levels, uh, people uh, who have financial concerns and uh, younger population groups have lower trust uh, levels. What is uh, striking in the, in the case of Ireland is that some of, the, of these gaps are very wide. Here I'm showing you uh, trust in government among the older cohorts, so basically people 50 or over, as compared to the younger population groups. And we see that there is a very important difference while uh, about 60% of people uh, 50 or over trust the national government. This comes down to uh, just about 20% uh, for uh, people between uh, 18 and 34. And this is the largest gap in OECD countries. The gap exists for all countries, but in Ireland it's particularly uh, wide. And another area that we included in the in the survey and where we see uh, some uh, 
uh, interesting results for, for uh, Ireland is about addressing uh, future challenges and prioritizing citizen concerns. We added a question about uh, what type of uh, policies it should be prioritized. And what we find in, in Ireland is that 70% of the population think that it's important to uh, prioritize tackling uh, climate change uh, issues and problems. Nonetheless, only a small margin of the population, relatively small share of the population, about 21%, think that the government will actually succeed in uh, in doing uh, in doing so. So uh, some uh, mixed results, some very positive results when it comes to satisfaction with services, uh, access to information, uh, and uh, fairness of treatment of their own application, some challenges in terms of responsiveness and uh, addressing uh, future challenges and the expectation of whether or not government will succeed. So let me now go through uh, to conclude the presentation uh, uh, on some examples of how we have used uh, this data. And this comes from uh, some countries where in addition to implementing the survey, we have done in-depth country case studies, combining uh, different methodologies, talking with the stakeholders, and also doing some uh, additional uh, qualitative results, uh, qualit qualitative work. So basically the first study of this sort that we did was for South Korea in uh, 2018, where we found that uh, basically uh, there was a very large room to improve to improve uh, trust uh, in, uh, in national government and in the civil service if innovation capacity could be strengthened and could be uh, generalized across the public uh, sector. What has happened since then is that, uh, well, trust building has been included as a key lever and indicator in the national innovation strategies of the Ministry of Interior and Safety. That is the one that coordinates national innovation strategy and many spaces for, uh, let's say, engagement and coordination with people, but also across uh, public institutions have been created. As a result, Korea has improved a lot in uh, their trust indicators and continue to monitor this uh, closely. It's one of the countries where we see very high trust level all across the, the, the survey and where we are able to build a, a trust survey because we did a first data collection in 2017 and see that there are important jumps and important increases in public trust. The second example is from Finland. There the situation was a little bit uh, different. This was a, is a high trusting country, so high levels of trust to start with. The problem there was that there was low level of political efficacy, meaning that uh, not a big share of the population uh, considered that they were able to influence what the government was doing. Uh, basically, uh, the following the, the publication of the study, the Finnish government put together a, a group to analyze how the recommendations could be implemented, and they created a uh, they recommended that they said that these recommendations have to be implemented by a, a variety of stakeholders. So there is a multi stakeholder strategy, including Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, and Well being Services. Just to give one example of concrete example of what they have done. So basically, during the COVID, they had these uh, COVID dialogues that they put in place to check on people's concerns, worries, uh, preoccupations during the COVID pandemic. And uh, this contributed a lot for people to feel engagement and that they had a voice. Uh, in the report, we recommended to extend these, to make them permanent and to extend it to other areas. Now they will move to national dialogues on key uh, priority areas uh, in the country, for instance, on migration and, edu and other issues. So this will continue as a dynamic that could help strengthening this political efficacy. And to conclude, the last example is uh, for Norway, where basically uh, there were uh, some problems uh, on responsiveness of services, and notably uh, some concerns about the balance between time devoted to frontline provision of services and uh, time spent uh, in reporting and in uh, kind of not focusing on uh, core functions of the job for service uh, providers. In this sense, they have launched uh, what they call a trust reform, which is a bottom-up strategy 
based on a trust system to identify how they can better level up this balance between time spent in core functions and time spent on reporting, of course, very much built on a trust uh, system and a trust uh, models. So these are three very concrete examples, and I, I hope I, uh, I am not running too much uh, uh, over time. Just to say that I have given you a snapshot of the results. There is much more in the report that I invite you to, to consult, and uh, also to say that these results will uh, inform the OECD Public Governance Ministerial Meeting that will take place uh, next November in uh, Luxembourg. So thanks a lot for your time and for your attention and looking forward to the rest of, uh, of the discussion. Thank you, Santiago, and you're perfectly within your time. So thank you very, very much. It was great to hear about the international context context and to see comparative figures for Ireland. It's also great to bring in those examples there around how people are working on improving um, the, the, the creation of that trust on an international basis. So it's fantastic to have those really practical examples to really bring the study to life. So thank you for that, Santiago. It's really reassuring to hear that Ireland scores strongly on lots of indicators. For us in the QCSN, high figures for ease of finding information about administrative procedures, which is over 80%, and perceived fair treatment in applications for a benefit or service, which is at over 75%, are really, really heartening. At our last network meeting, we discussed the findings of the 2022 Business Customer Satisfaction Survey. And it's interesting to compare the trust findings with the findings of that survey. In some areas, the surveys have contrasting findings, for example, in relation to perceptions about innovation, 70% of business customers thought services had become more innovative in the last five years. And we all know of lots of innovations that have emerged during the pandemic. However, the trust survey found that just over 25% of respondents thought public bodies would adopt innovative ideas. This anomaly is perhaps due to the different audiences surveyed, but it's possible that communications can help to bridge the gap. The question is, are we communicating our innovative approaches better to one community over another? The importance of communication is something we might pick up on later in the Q&A. While there are some differences between the surveys, there are also some striking similarities. Both surveys point to issues around perceived responsiveness, which I'm sure for anyone who's at the last meeting, this will be very familiar to you. The business survey found that only 30% of customers agreed that the civil service has good procedures for making complaints about levels of service received. And the trust survey echoed this with just 33% saying they believe public services would be improved following public complaints. So we've a lot to unpick here, especially in the area of listening and responding to our customers and communicating that we are responding. I'm sure we'll come back to this in the Q&A as well. We're now going to switch our focus from the international context and move to hear about the application of insights about trust in the Irish context. So I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Mary Walker from On Garda Síochána. She's a research psychologist with On Garda Síochána and she's involved with the Public Attitude Survey, which is a social survey of people's attitude towards crime and policing. The survey has been ongoing for many years and has been specifically exploring trust since 2015, which gives a real wealth of data in that specific area. As you heard from Santiago, On Garda Síochána has high levels of trust when compared with other OECD countries, which is good news for our country. Mary is going to bring us through some of On Garda Síochána's findings in relation to trust, and she's also going to share how that organisation has been using the survey results to build public trust. Again, if you do have any questions, will you please add them to the Q&A and we'll address them with the panel at the end. Mary, you're very welcome. Thanks very much, Margaret. And I'm going to try to share my slides now. So you might let me know if you can see them. Yep, that's fine, Mary. Just slideshow mode then. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, take it away. Okay, so that's okay, right. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, 
I didn't, well, I wasn't aware of the organization, the network, but I'm very much looking forward to being a part of it now. And I think there's going to be a wealth of information um, that I can gather um, from it. So I suppose just to give you a background. Um, as Margaret said, my name is Mary Walker and I'm a research psychologist in the Garda Research Unit attached to the Garda Survey. And I, along with my colleague, uh, Sergeant Caroline Copeland, who will be in the questions and answers uh, section, um, we manage the Garda Public Attitude Survey. Um, it's outsourced to a market research company and it comes back in, we analyze it and we produce the annual report. So it has been running um, since the 1990s. And back um, up until 2008, when austerity kicked in and then there was no money and everything stopped. It was done every two years and there was a 10,000 person sample and it was generally done between April and July each year. The, the, there was a wealth of information, but there was, it was an adult only survey, so it was 18 plus. It was relaunched in 2015 and it incorporated one adult survey and a separate young person surveys of 16 and 17 year olds. And it was conducted yearly with the exception of COVID in 2020. It hadn't been conducted then, uh, but we did do an online survey um, uh, uh, on a public uh, on public attitudes. Um, so the data that we'll be looking at is based on 2019. We have the report done and it's and um, the, for 2021, but it's actually going to be released next month. So unfortunately, we're a month early, but I will give an indication of the an increase or decrease in in the, the findings. So the survey it it was up from from 2015 to 2019 a 6,000 person survey, and now since 2021 it's 7,600. So it means that um, at this stage now, we can actually analyze at a divisional level the new uh, 19 operating model divisions. Um, so that actually means that we're just going to have much more meaningful information at a, a, a smaller geographical area. So for implementation, uh, it'll, it'll be great. Um, and like I said, the 2021 data will be released um, uh, next month. So I suppose really the public attitude survey, it's kind of the main barometer um, for a number of key performance indicators for Angarda Shukana. And it ranges from perceptions of local and national crime, policing priorities that the public might have, how they rank them, um, fear of crime, worry about victimization, the impact on their quality of life of that fear of crime. Um, it looks at views on guard of visibility, guard of presence. Uh, it asks people, um, whether they've been a victim of crime in the preceding 12 months and their experience of the Garda service as a victim of crime. It also looks at satisfaction with the Garda service. Obviously, the one the one for today is trust in Angarda Shea And the other aspects it looks at is equality of treatment statements and perceptions of Angarda Shea and that would kind of quality focus, whether it's friendly or helpful. And from Last year, we asked two questions and whether whether the public felt it on Garda Shikana was human rights focused and whether it was representative of the diverse community that it served. Um, so there, so there, so we're really looking forward to um, sharing the findings of those new questions next month. So um, for this presentation, I tried to ground the public attitude survey uh, in parallel with the QCS principles as well as the OCD report. So I was looking at the 12 principles and I was thinking, okay, well, what does what what of these does the Gardet Public Attitude Survey have? And I suppose in standards, yes, it's a barometer of where we fit within the standards that we're trying to maintain. So it does, it does kind of capture that. In regard to quality, equality and diversity, like I just mentioned, we have a, a diversity question um, within the, the last public attitude survey, but there's a lot of equality statements. Um, within it and I'm going to talk about them. Information, I suppose, when we when we when we think about information, we talk about whether it's generally in relation to victims of crime. And um generally we have about big crime say that about just over 50% feel that they get about about um, a right the right amount of information. Um and only one percent feel they get too much and about 30% feel that there's too little information. Um, 
timeliness and courtesy is another kind of uh, principle that we have tied in with the with the QCS one. And really, I suppose in timeliness, we're really kind of talking about for us whether so, whether a victim of crime feels that they've responded. And about sixty one percent of victims feel that the guards have responded quickly to the, to, to their incident. Um, consultation and evaluation, I suppose. Really, uh, the public attitude survey, in essence, is consultation with the public um, so that and we can we continuously in the Garda research unit and in the Garda analysis service um, continuously look at the practices within the guards. We evaluate different projects um, Carol and myself. We have evaluated the, the DPSU, um, the Division of Protective Services um, units. We've We've um, also evaluated um, Garda Reserves, uh, the Sex Offender Risk Assessment Management Units, and various different units and practices within within the Guards. Regarding the official languages equality, I suppose, regarding the Public Attitude Survey, it's produced in English and Irish. And equally, in a wider policing context, we would have um, interpreters available if needed for witnesses uh, offenders or um, or victims. Um, better coordination. We're constantly trying to look within the public attitude survey of where are there areas for a need for more resources. What are what are what are respondents saying um, that there's gaps in? And then within that, then we try to see okay, is there a need for some resources and a better allocation of resources elsewhere? Um, the QCS principle of internal customers, I suppose I've tweaked that a little bit to a, we have a range of customers. So in the public attitude survey, about 85% of the survey, people have no contact with the guards, which is which is great because in one way, who wants to be in contact with the guards? It's kind of um, uh, you're either as, a, as an offender or you might be a victim. So. Um, so really, eighty-five percent of people don't have contact, but we're we're a presence within the country. Um, Fifteen percent then would either be a self-initiated contact, whether they're reporting a crime or whether they they are coming in for a passport, or and and equally if we are to initiate contact, and we could be stopping people at a checkpoint or um, prosecuting people. So there's a range of customers. So I think that's where the two, uh, the principles and the guard, uh, the public action survey and the wider policing kind of um, have contact points. So trust as a concept, it, it was, I, I thought that I was going to go back to the ninety public attitude survey, and I said, this is going to be amazing. I'm going to be able to track trust from the 1990s. And then I realized that actually trust as a concept was only introduced into the public attitude survey questionnaire in 2015. And I think that's probably telling in itself, really, that the concept of trust um, was obviously considered important um, at that stage. And we do have a wealth of information since then. So what we, we do is we ask for people to um, take on a scale of one to ten, one being no, no, uh, no trust to high trust. And we recode it then into low trust, mid trust and um, high trust. And um, generally the, the between mid trust and high trust, we're up at the 90s, uh, the 90s um, percentage um each year which is great um that, that, that there's a high that, that it, we've tracked quite a high um trust level in angarshia corner for the last number of years since 2015. um and i suppose i noticed in the oecd report that that uh, there was cross tabs between non-trust pe people that don't trust um don't trust organizations and people that do trust and i suppose for us um the sample size probably would be quite low for us to do that because thankfully there's only about 10 10 percent of respondents are kind of coming back with that so then i was looking at the trust by demographics and um yeah i was interested that some of the there's some parallels with the oecd report um uh, that santiago was saying that and that they're mirrored here as well females are generally they're more likely to report higher trust um, in the guards to varying degrees, to varying percentage points. Equally, age 
respondents aged 65 tend to have higher um higher trust levels um regarding social class of all the social classes social class f uh, displays higher levels of trust in Ogalishigana than others. And I think the, that F would be the farmer background, the farmer, farmers more so than any other ones. And non nationals are, are more likely to have higher levels of trust than nationals. Um, another, I suppose, when we look at the 16 to 17 year olds, they, they have quite high trust as well, but actually it's, it's marginally smaller than the, the national kind of average that we have. And, and people from Dublin tend to have lower levels of trust uh, than other areas. Um, and city, equally city respondents have less likely to report high trust. Um, so there's obviously something about trust in the, the urban areas and in obviously um, the, the capital. Okay. Then, um, I suppose, just some of the findings in relation to trust. Um, if you are a victim of crime, uh, you will, you are impacted by that and it does reduce the, the level of trust. You can see that, that there's 21% um, uh, 21% uh, have said that they've low trust in Ongar Shikana. And that could be due to the way that their case was handled um, or a number of, of, number of variables. Um, Equally, the, the level of trust by satisfaction, the more people are dissatisfied or quite dissatisfied or very satisfied with the guards, the trust, the trust, um, uh, the trust, increase, the low levels of trust increase as well. And equally, um, trust in Angara Shikana by the contact, um, we can see there that um, the no contact Obviously, probably methodologically anyway is more is more kind of comparable to the to our the overall um, overall finding of that. It's it's quite similar that eight uh, percent display no um, no uh, or low low trust. But then you can see that the ones that have initiated contact are thirteen percent, and those with self self initiated contact are ten percent. So there's slight variations in relation to it. Um, when I looked at the OECD drivers, I was looking at um, the, of the five of them. I was thinking about reliability, and I suppose we have one of the equality statements. Gardaí can be relied to be there when you need them, and we can see that that is coming in at about um, sixty-four and twelve. It's about seventy-six percent um, of respondents said agreed that they would be there. Um, and then when I was thinking about responsiveness, I suppose for us, when we think of responsive response, we think of, oh, are guards responding to incidents? And we know from the victims that, that over 60% are saying that they're arriving quickly. But I suppose in relation to the OECD um, report, it's, it's more kind of linked in with um, feedback and whether whether you're listening to us. And I suppose the question there that Gardaí listen to the concerns of people is quite high at um, 80, 86. But then actually are Gardaí dealing with the things that matter to the local community is much lower. You can see there that um, that it's it's much lower. It's forty seven and six and and fourteen percent. So it's about sixty sixty odd. So there is a disconnect between those two. So I kind of felt from that point of view that's actually really interesting. Um, fairness, um, as um, the majority of people feel that guards will treat you with uh, with respect and will treat you fairly, um, regardless of who you are. And we're glad to see that that's that's seven. You're looking at seven out of ten people. And I suppose an openness um, and integrity in relation to openness, I suppose we try, we strive to be kind of try to be open and approachable. And we do that in the form of um, access to our data. Um, we we do that in relation to research requests. We, we do that within our unit and we try to be, you know, um, other than other than, I suppose, um, identifying people. Um, or victims or um, kind of issues relating to uh, police craft that we don't that, that would reveal that. We try to keep the integrity there for um, confidentiality um, in relation to our openness. Um, so I thought that that was kind of an interesting kind of um, perspective. Equally, um, the perceptions of, of the guards, um, friendly, friendly 
the guards as an organization and um, the responders at 94 percent are saying they're more friendly or helpful and that we're community focused and i think these are kind of very very important for building trust too um and that we're 70 percent feeling that 70 71 percent are saying that we're modern or progressive um where we kind of fall down really is that um well managed in 2019 was it was 59 percent that has increased in in the 2021 um in the 2021 20, findings so there was a couple of things between the two reports that were really interesting i suppose that uh, Santiago had mentioned that um, generally trust um, people trust their civil service and their local government more than the national national government. And um, in Ireland and in our public attitude survey, we see that with that um, people will generally say that the the local crime problem is um, only about twenty percent say that it's a serious or very serious problem. Whereas in the national context, they'll say seventy percent of them will say that it is. Um, that is a serious or a very serious problem. So I wonder, is there a similar mindset in all, irrespective of what the question will be in, ra in rating the local problem or the local issue in relation to the national issue? Um, we were delighted to see in the OCD report that the trust in the police is quite high in and around 75% and noticing that in, in the courts, I think it was a little bit reduced in 68% or something like that um, for Ireland and uh, I suppose that might tie in with the whole idea of um, lenient sentences or whether people feel that they've got their, their day in court. Um, but a really interesting dichotomy for me was this idea of reliability versus responsiveness. And I suppose that, that, that concept that I just mentioned, that we kind of look at it as responding to incidences, but actually the idea of being responsive to the feedback that people give and what we do about it. Um, so that, that's a, that's a takeaway for me. And I really like the concept too in the OCD report regarding trust as, as having an input and having an output. And I suppose we the input is that in the sense that it's helping or hindering an organization in its policies. Um, and I think for us, we really saw that in the pandemic, that when policing had to have the checkpoints and all of that, and the public had to work with us and believe and trust in what we were doing. Um, and I think that that experience and that change of um, policing style in the pandemic was very it was very kind of um, important, and it kind of focused our attention maybe on how the public trust us um, or not. Um, and I'm trying to whistle stuff through this now. Um, so this is my last slide. And I, so I suppose what does this all mean? So I suppose we have we have the we have the information. Um, we have. Um, findings in the in the police in, in the in the public attitude survey and what do we do with them we generally they feed back in to our policing plans and our corporate strategies now thankfully we have a division analysis of that so that can be adopted and the findings can really be tailored at a divisional level um which really which will really kind of hone the experience for 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 the public in that particular division we will continue to evaluate and consult with the public, um, be it in police practices, be it in the public attitude survey, victim surveys, um, and we continue to be open to, to any um, consultation that um, researchers or, um, or universities want um, to collaborate with us. Um, since 2015 or 2017, uh, there was a code of ethics that was implemented in at every guard and guard uh, guard uh, member and guard staff um, completed training in it. And I suppose it looks at it ties in with the values within the guards of honesty, accountability, respect, professionalism, and empathy, and. And really, and I think that those those concepts that if adopted by the members in their daily interactions with the public, um, we'll kind of see showing that actually it will, it will I suppose, translate into um, 
satisfaction, trust in our Garda Sheikh Rana and in the, into a better Garda service to, to all uh, members of the public. And I think, um, I suppose we strive for that. And I think that with all of this, it's probably bridging the gap. We have a barometer of how, um, how we're doing. If we're not doing well in certain areas, we try to improve. And it's just a pinpointing where 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 we're failing and where we can improve. And in that, we're, we have to be accountable for our actions um, and, and just continue, continue the fight of striving to, to improve. And that is me done. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. That was really interesting. And I love the way that you weaved the two surveys together to tell us the story there. I was also really interested by your um, statement about the differing perceptions of people, depending on what their interaction with the guard, uh, with on guard the Sheikhana was about. We would have similar in revenue because obviously there would be a different perception depending on whether we're, somebody were coming to us for a refund or we were going to somebody for taxes overdue to, due to no, non-compliance. Um, but in all cases, I you still want- you, sorry. Margaret. <laughs> oh, can I, can anyone else hear me? Yeah. Yep. No problem. I'm assuming you're saying lovely things anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I'm not sure what's happening there, Mary, but absolutely. I said lots of lovely things. <laughs> um, the experience of on Garda Siakona with applying the findings is really, really interesting. And I think it provides food for thought for all of us. Um, Mary's presentation, I think, draws a line under discussions we've been having in, within the network about how we can listen to our customers, how we can operationalise the data and insights we get from our customers to improve services and trust. And Garda Siakona provides a really good example of demonstrating responsiveness, and this is something that we're obviously very interested in learning more about. In revenue, for example, I know that every Friday our MAC, which is our senior leadership team, gets a list of all the complaints and ombudsman cases which are being examined. This means that they are basically reaching the highest level of the organization and they are being explored by the MAC. This allows us to examine whether specific types of complaints are once off part of a trend, which will help us to understand if we have endemic issues and will also help, to, help us to diagnose problems and understand where we can improve our processes. This is just one example. I know these processes and actions are happening in different ways across all of our organizations. So we'd like to hear about what's happening in your organization. How are you listening to your customers? How are you listening to your frontline staff? What practical ways have you found to make sure those insights deliver real benefits? How have you turned those insights into actions that lead to continuous improvement? We would really, really love to hear from you on this. And you can let Nora know through the QCS email. So we now move into the Q&A part of our morning, and I'm really excited to see where the discussion goes now. Hopefully, Mary's um, issues with volume will have been resolved. Um, we've had some really excellent presentations today, and I'm sure that there are lots and lots of questions. So we'll open the discussion on the questions we've received so far. I'm at this point going to hand over to Nora, but just to remind you, as always, you can still submit questions in the Q&A function. Thanks, Margaret. Um, so just very briefly before we get into the trust questions, a question has come in there for Maria. Um, can non-civil service public service bodies like ETBs access the training modules and one learning? Hi, uh, thanks, Nora. No, not at the moment. So our training is just for civil servants. But as I said, what we have done is we have shared some of our, our, our materials with non-civil service bodies, but we would be happy to discuss that with you directly if you wanted to contact me. Thanks, Maria. Um, and Mary, I think we have a couple of questions there for you. So just checking that you can hear me. Yeah, so Mary's just logged out. I'm just going to come back in to see if that. Oh, um, so if we have okay. any questions for Santiago, potentially first. We can okay, start yeah, so Santiago, there was one came through there. Um, I think you mentioned about one of the country. Um, one of the countries that you did a more in-depth review with was Norway and um, that there was kind of high satisfaction there, but also a perception maybe about responsiveness being lower. So that kind of mirrors what's happening here in Ireland. And um, the question was just, do you, can you share a little bit more about how Norway um, implemented the insights to kind of build trust in response to that sort of high 
customer satisfaction, but low perceived responsiveness in government? Yes, definitely. So what they have done and is an ongoing process is that they have launched what they have called their trust reform. So this is a reform that is basically looking towards uh, examples or good practices from uh, public institutions, from public servants on how they can rebalance better their workload towards focusing more on in frontline provision and less in reporting. So a, a little bit gaining again uh, that trust or that trust-based model that allowed them to work to, uh, uh, let's say, advance new solutions, these solutions to be implemented in the field and not into much into a rigid system where they have to be reporting all the time. So this was part of all of this with the intention of, of course, improve service delivery, uh, strengthen satisfaction and overall uh, also continue, continue deepening and strengthening this trust in, in public uh, services. So they, this is an ongoing process. They are, of course, undergoing a, a consultation across different uh, institutions on what type of actions could this be. It's a, it's a, it's a reform that is uh, to be applied, let's say, continuously, either as, they, as they said, but this is very much an ongoing process that has this spirit of a little bit rebalancing or re rethinking the way public servants and public institutions are uh, actually working as a mechanism to preserve this strong trust bond between uh, people and their institutions and their services. So there are there is more out there, but, but in a nutshell, this is what they have done and this is happening. This is led by the Ministry of Local Government and Modernization who has this portfolio and that is kind of uh, pushing this uh, reform through the the whole uh, administration. Uh, so and and it's uh, it's quite new. So the the reform started basically with the new uh, government that came uh, in office a few months ago, and uh, and it's uh, a little bit in the makeup. But our results have a, a lot contributed to fill fill the discussions and to I uh, spot the issues where there may be possibilities to actually streamline and rebalance uh, this, uh, this uh, let's say, working environment or working for a uh, working, let's say, set up for public employees. Thanks, Santiago. So kind of moving from um, our internal processes and internal reporting and maybe moving towards a kind of a more agile and innovative um, approach that's very visible to the customer in terms of responsiveness. Is that kind of what I'm getting yes, that's there? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And um, another question that came through, Santiago, um, in the Irish uh, results, it did show that there was quite a gap there between um the age groups in terms of trust and actually mary i think some of this uh, was for you as well because in the data that you presented mary there was a much lower gap between young and older people in terms of the trust so the trust gap is smaller in angarda shikona than it seems to be in the wider population um so for both of you really how do we kind of meet people where they are so young people how do we tailor communications maybe to them to ensure and how does Angarda Siakana engage with people to ensure that we um, are narrowing that gap and I suppose I'm thinking maybe of the success of the um, campaigns during COVID-19. I know the Government Information Service spoke to us recently as well um, about how, the, how they operationalized that and how they targeted their communications to young people. So I suppose for both Santiago and Mary, um, just to ask you that, how can we how can we narrow that gap? It looks like it's being done successfully in Angarda Siakon already. Yeah. Um... Sorry about that. I had to step out. My here the the thing went wonky. So I'm back to you. Um, yeah. I suppose. I suppose with any kind of trust, it's meeting somebody at their level, and I think the community policing model is really brilliant in that regard. Meeting young people at their level, um, and then incorporating those values and principles of kind of empathy, respect, um, and honesty with young people. I think. Um, is where where you can meet them at their own level and that they don't feel that you actually false in it. 
Um, I don't know where the bounds are, how further you can move from a 90%. Um, but there's always, there's always, you know, I suppose, uh, areas to kind of strive. And I think, you know, I suppose in the kind of hard to reach groups or kind of more diverse populations, I think that's probably where, uh, where we probably would want to even make more strides um, or where we continue um, to focus attention. Santiago, did you have any insights from from other countries how they're managing this um, this issue? I mean, I mean, yes, definitely. I think it, it talks very much to what Mary just said. Just two things come to mind. I mean, one general thing that we hear throughout the OECD is that the young uh, younger groups are harder to reach. They have their own language, <clears throat> their own channels, their own. Uh, expectations so definitely you need to get at their level as mary was saying two examples i could think of that uh, to me are, are very telling of, of how this could be done uh, and maybe you have similar things in ireland but uh, in the case of finland for instance when they did these lockdown uh, dialogues uh, about the COVID, they also had uh, one of these dialogues that uh, was directed exclusively to children for example where the prime minister engaged with them in a dialogue to hear their concerns about COVID, how they were experiencing, what they were they fears. So, uh, I mean, to it very relatively small children, so as a way of also kind of take them into account and, and uh, listening to their viewpoint. So this to me is one example of how you engage with different communities and it's possible to do at all levels. Second example I could think of is we are currently also doing um, a case study uh, on drivers of trust in New Zealand. And uh, in New Zealand, uh, well, as you probably know, there is a very important 16% of the population of, that is indigenous population. That is also very difficult to engage uh, with and to communicate with because they have uh, basically their own culture, their own reivindications. So one thing that happened is that during the uh, vaccination campaign, they were not being able to convince Maori population to get uh, vaccinated. They were not trusting at all official communication channels that the government was uh, providing, and there was a lot of hesitancy on whether or not to take the vaccines. Uh, the way they sort this out and the, how they turn around this is that, that they had to work with the leaders of the community, so the iwi leaders, the iwi are like their communities, so that they convince their communities to actually get the vaccines. So it was through going through them, let them communicate in their own way, let them kind of uh, build up from their constituencies so that they would actually engage with this uh, national uh, policy. Which also brings me to one of the points that was uh, raised at the, at the very beginning by Margaret when she framed the discussion that Communication is a very important aspect in building trust and targeted communication to the different groups could definitely contribute in uh, kind of uh, diminishing these gaps. Yeah, and just to clarify, the gap I showed was uh, for trust in national government. So, so it's, it's, it's a kind of, a, it's a slightly different than for the police. So just to, to make that, uh, that clarification. But this would be two examples that come to mind of, of how you have to find the right kind of communication and engagement channels with the different communities so that you can actually uh, close these gaps because uh, mainstream uh, means may not work as well for everyone. Thanks, Santiago. I think there's just one other question there actually for Mary. Um, it looked like there is a very high perception that Angarda Shikona is a, as a modern and progressive organization. And something that came up there in the um, trust survey was kind of low perceptions around innovativeness um, more widely in, in the public institutions. Um, so I suppose we're wondering what, what can be learned? What can we learn from Angarda Shikona about how you communicate your responsiveness and your innovativeness um, and, and what's bringing that higher perceptions of, of being a modern and progressive organization. Would you have any insights on that, Mary? Yeah, um, I, I don't know off the top of my head because I think that like sometimes with the public attitude survey, it's great that and you nearly need to do some qualitative analysis to really drill down. But I suppose, well, I, I'm thinking that um, modern and progressive, I suppose, it could be that they're comparing it with other police forces 
in, in the world or or that they might be new innovations. And I do think that I suppose um, in communications over the last number of years between Facebook um, between Facebook and I suppose different Twitter and Instagram and different kind of um, modes in that way that we seem to have uh, really kind of come to the fore in that um, and that our even our internal communications was much more um, streamlined and wasn't as um, I suppose the language wasn't as complicated or as, as formal. There was kind of a face to, to it. Um, but I suppose um, sometimes I suppose good investigations that have followed through um, and that uh, an awful lot of work at the analysis service um, where there's some really good prosecutions based on, you know, high tech analysis uh, has also really, um, I feel, given um, given people confidence in it and, and as, as being modern and progressive. And equally, we, I suppose we've over the last number of years, we have different leadership teams, you know, and we've um, we've more, um, uh, I suppose, the commissioner and the deputies from outside have come in and that might kind of lend itself to people feeling that we're more modern and progressive as well. But that's my take on it, I suppose, for to get an understanding, we really have to consult as one of the principals, <laughs> consult, uh, consult with the public to kind of really find out what they feel um, that it is, uh, why they feel that it's kind of um, modern and progressive. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, so coming back again to consulting and communicating really strong themes yeah. that are kind of developing there um, through this morning. Um, Margaret, I might hand back to you. I don't think we have any further questions here, but if you have any others or if you if I might hand back to you there. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks very much, Nora. Um, actually, just see another question gone in there now, so we might answer that before we wrap up, if that's OK. Um, so um, the question is around uh, the PS trying to incorporate accessibility issues into the survey in terms of reaching out to Irish sign language users or other disability groups. How was that approached? And I think PAS, um, is this aimed at Mary again, public attitude survey? Um, so, Mary, that question is for you. And how were how did you ensure that the survey was inclusive for um, persons with a disability or maybe um, users with I Irish sign language users? Yeah, I suppose um, we outsource it to um, we outsource it to a market research company, and the company that we are using at the moment is uh, Behavior and Attitudes, and. Um, it's a good question and actually I feel I need to follow up on that myself because I don't know the answer and that and I suppose that's that's the truth of it um and it's one that um I suppose one of the principles is inclusivity and you know and having everybody in the public you know with with obviously um with with disabilities and and various uh, things included in the survey so actually that's something that i need to follow up on um and to see actually what the company does and also um we don't actually have a question asking people whether you know they have a disability or not you know what i mean so it's something that we need to you need to look at um yeah Okay, thanks, Mary. And look, I, I, I think what you've just said there represents and demonstrates that idea of responsiveness. You've been asked a question, you're unsure of the answer, so yeah. you're going to look into that. And I, if that answer can maybe come back to the QCSN, Nora could filter it back um, to the network, yeah, which would be fantastic. No problem. No problem. Um, because in the, spirit, in the spirit of openness and um, transparency, you know what I mean? It's a valid question and it's something that um, I, I'll communicate back. Um, I'll follow up on it and I'll communicate back on it. Um, yeah, and it's something I suppose it's in and, in and of itself. It's something that we probably need to think about um, more holistically for future uh, surveys as well. For for it to be inclusive and to kind of have for it to be um, representative of all the population. Absolutely. I and just it's, it's... see one other question. Sorry, <laughs> Margaret. Actually, <laughs> no, I just okay. saw one other, and I might just put it out before um, we move we move on. It's just um, asking how do you evidence to service users that you have implemented change on foot of their feedback? So, um, how do you how do you demonstrate you said we did is is what the question is there. So I don't know if Santiago and or Mary would both have any comments on that. Uh, I mean, 
basically our questions that I think it's important to, to bear in mind that at the end we are talking about the trust and the trustworthiness of public institutions that we define at the uh, expectation of positive behavior by these institutions. So in a way, our questions are formulated in a way that ask respondents to place themselves in a situation where they are confronted with whether a institution will do X or Y, where they expect this something to happen. Of course, this will depend on the experience they have had in the past, uh, what they have been told about institutions, but it's an expectation about future behavior. The way in which we could potentially assess this, and we hope to assess this, is once we are able to actually build our time series. So now we are planning the next wave of the series and we are able to, and we hope to be able to track the evolution of these things over time. So to see how, uh, let's say, how, uh, let's say, responses have uh, evolved, how things have changed, and then to get a sense of what type of actions have been taken that could lead to these uh, changes. In, in trust trustworthiness. So it's a, li a little bit of a long uh, term uh, approach, but for us, it will be the meaningful meaningful way of doing it and on, on building a robust uh, evidence uh, base. I don't know if that answered the, the question precisely, but yes, I did get a little bit more context on, on how we do the thing. That's great, Santiago. Thanks. And just from an organizational perspective, then, Mary, um, how do you uh, in Nangarda Siakana go about demonstrating, you know, you said we did? Yeah, I suppose with any report or anything that, you know, you, you have recommendations, you have findings. And I remember being at a conference in Lisbon with all of the police re researchers and the whole one of the big kind of um, questions for us was that what happens to the research and it's it's nearly easy okay sometimes your problem with access to individuals or whatever you can overcome that you do the research and sometimes you just don't know where where, where things go whether things are implemented or not wholeheartedly or in part and i think that's actually the challenge for any researcher and uh, it's the challenge for for um being able to track in a measurable sense um you know, and I think we've seen that with the ferns reports and all different reports, lots of findings and that it's not transferable into well, what was the action? And um, so I think it is a challenge, um, but I think in one way it nearly. When you have a finding the next step in the acceptance in the organization, are we accepting this recommendation or finding and actually putting an action in place and 1 that can be measurable. Um, I think is, is it would be would be a kind of a good step. And there was something that popped into my head that uh, in regards to the last questions about the, uh, the disability stuff, we are actually doing a number of uh, hard to reach groups and some of them and, and some of them would be young people. Some of them might be different ethnic groups. And I think maybe that's where one of the, the ones with the, the disabilities might actually be captured there rather than incorporated into the public attitude survey that it might actually have to be um, kind of a standalone. That's really interesting. Thanks a million, Mary. So now, Margaret, I really will hand back to you. I think we are <laughs> done with the questions. Thanks a million. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much to Maria, Mary and Santiago for your presentations this morning, but also for the great level of engagement in the Q&A and the additional insights that you've shared with us. I'm sure everyone would agree we could stay here for the day and um, talking about this. It's a very interesting topic. I'd also like to thank the audience for your um, engagement. And for those who submitted questions, thank you very much for your very insightful questions. It's really brought us off into some very interesting discussion areas. So a huge thank you to everybody. Um, our topic today has really been fascinating. I'm sure you'll agree, we've only scratched the surface of it. If we had all day, if we had all week, we could sit here and talk about it. Trust is a complex topic. There are lots of exogenous factors like demographics, socioeconomic status, um, perceptions based on personal history, which can all impact how we perceive and trust public bodies. I think today's discussion, though, has been really, really important because we've learned that there's lots that we can do in our organizations and in our interactions to continue to build trust. And Mary's presentation really showed us practical example of how on Gorda Siakona are tackling the issues. Well, Santiago's presentation helped us see what drivers of trust we're doing well in and where there might be room for improvement. 
there's lots to be proud of. Ireland fared really, really well in the international context. And I think we can say that our public services are generally seen as accessible, reliable and trustworthy. It will be important to address the gaps and use the feedback as a driver for continuous improvement as we move forward. For me, it was really interesting to see that parallel between Angarda Siakona and OECD in terms of age related trust. And that's a question that came up as well. We need to plan for the future customer and build trust with them. As Nora has said, we need to meet our customers where they are. Mary asked the question at the end, what does this all mean? That's a question we should all be asking ourselves on an ongoing basis. We cannot be complacent. By digging a little deeper and understanding the drivers of trust, which the OECD have highlighted our responsiveness, reliability, openness, integrity, and fairness, we can see where we need to improve. To keep building and maintaining trust, we need to find new and innovative ways of engaging with our customers. And we need to design our ser services around our customers. Put the customer at the center of everything you do, and we will ultimately build stronger relationships. Maria mentioned a number of courses earlier, a lot around customer centric design, and they're really, really important here. So I'd encourage everybody to tap into that resource. And as Maria has pointed out, even if you are outside the civil service and you're, if you're in the broader public service, you can make contact directly with her to discuss what options are there. The design approach is already being used really effectively in some of our organizations. And I know we've discussed this at QCSN events in the past with examples from, for example, the Department of Justice. We now have an opportunity to adopt user-centered design approaches to make all our processes and services really responsive. By asking the right questions of our customers and by accurately diagnosing problems, we will better understand needs and we'll be able to co-create and design better services with our customers. By communicating more effectively, and Santiago and Mary have both emphasized the importance of that communication this morning. By communicating how we're innovating and how we respond to customer needs, we can accurately just demonstrate responsiveness to our customers, which is something that's really important to building trust. And we've been clearly um, given a message here that our communication in this space may not be as clear as we would want it to be. So on that point, I'd just like to reiterate that we're really, really interested to hear about what's happening in your individual organizations. Again, how are you listening to your customers? How are you listening to your frontline staff? And what practical ways have you found to make sure that the insights that you're gleaning are being fed back into your processes? Again, I'd urge you to contact Nora at the QCSN if you'd like to share any of the work that you're doing here. I feel that there may be an event <laughs> could, could fall out of that. So before I conclude, I just want to hand you briefly over to Nora with some um, announcements uh, before we finish up this morning. So Nora. Thanks, Margaret. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everyone um, in the network who took part in the survey recently on the uh, communications toolkit. Um, so your feedback has been really important there and that's all been drawn together now by um, ourselves and by NALA and by the National Disability Authority as we begin to work on updates for the toolkit. So thank you all very much for that and we'll keep you posted with updates on that. Um, just to also mention that there is currently a public consultation on digital services. Um, um, and we're looking for feedback there on what services are important to the public and um, what would they like to see available digitally if it's not already there. Where are they having pain points with existing services? So um, I'm going to include a link to that survey um, in our next email out when we share the presentations. And um, if you could uh, spread that as far and wide as, as you can. And also, obviously, most of ourselves, we're, we're service users ourselves. So if you have any feedback you'd like to include there, please do. Um, finally, then, just to say that Innovation Week is coming up. It's the last week in October and um, it's going to include lots of really exciting events. We have a flagship conference in Cork and we also have lots of events happening throughout the week and throughout a huge variety of organisations across the public service, um, culminating actually on the Friday with the launch of principles for service design. So that's kind of a first start at hopefully um, 
you know, maybe explaining and implementing uh, an, a design approach to, to customer service. So that's something to look out for. And if you take a look on the website ops.gov.ie, you can find out all the details there. Um, so that's it for me. Just hand you back to Margaret. Okay, thank you very much, Nora. At this stage, I just want to remind everyone that the recording from today's webinar will be posted on ops.gov.ie. We'll notify you when it's up there. The next QCSN event will be our annual conference in December. Really excited to say that it is going to be a hybrid event this year. And um, so we're going to be back in Farmley. It will take place on Wednesday, the 7th of December. So put that in your diary. That's a really exciting save the date. Um, we're looking forward to seeing some of you there in person and obviously anyone who wants to attend online. So look, I would just like to thank everyone for your attendance this morning. Again, thank the speakers. Thank you to Nora and Owen for the organisation in the background that made this event seamless. And thanks everyone for your time. And we really look forward to seeing you in December. Have a great day.